Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the B2B Revenue Leadership Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about sales coaching, uh, sales management, sales leadership. Now, if you're in marketing, stick with this because I think it's generalized in that it's really about preparation, skill set, rapport building, being able to give feedback on a consistent basis to get people to move forward. I think it'd be applied to pretty much anything, developers, marketers, uh, you know, salespeople is so important because it's it's very much a performance based profession, meaning like marketing typically has an output. They produce a blog post, a podcast, a webinar. Uh, they do planning for trade shows. They do a lot of great things, but there's an output. There's not a, a daily performance in front of a customer. Sales is like that. And you don't get anything from your past performance if you don't apply it to your future current performance. It's much like a sports uh, player. If you're a great pitcher, uh, it doesn't matter how good your last game was. If the current game isn't going well, <laughs> you're getting pulled. Sorry, buddy. So we're going to be talking about that today with Alice. I have her come on. Uh, she's going to share quite a bit and she's going to give quite a bit away for free. So listen to the very end for that. I also want to make sure you're aware of courses that I'm offering at b2brevenue.com. Is your team not getting the meetings they want? And I keep hearing about these gimmicks. Gimmicks can work, but they don't scale. Highly personalization can work, but it doesn't scale. And when I say scale, I mean to have your calendar full of people that you want to talk to. Now, are they interested? Not yet. But you got to start the conversation with them. They don't care about your pitch. Your pitch can be amazing. You'll find the same 1% that happens to be in market, happen to find at the right time with the right message. Those days are over. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if you've noticed it, but those days are over. What we have to do is build rapport, find the right people. Start a conversation with them, get connected, become part of their tribe, and then we'll find out what what they really care about and build it from there. Start the conversation and get the meeting has been a game changer this year. It's really what's driven my business for the last five years. I've been teaching it in person. Now I teach it online. You get free one-on-ones. You get office hours every other week. You get core content and real user content, meaning I'm talking to people, applying it. There's now close to 25 hours of that. All you have to do is dedicate about an hour a week, and it becomes a process. It's not a binary thing. You know how to do it. You don't know how to do it. You'll know how to do it, but you've got to be able to execute against it. This has been an exciting week here with my partners. Over at Gong, Chris Orlob has produced another great blog post. This one about the power of video screen sharing when you're giving demos and presentations. And he gives a lot of great examples in the research that shows you're 40% more likely to close the deal if you do it in a screen share. Now, I, I wouldn't have believed this until I read it. And the blog post is very persuasive. You kind of know it. But, you know, sometimes you just don't want to – and I, I do my podcast interviews. I don't share the screen for a couple reasons. One, I like to – I think in my head and also the bandwidth uh, also becomes an issue on some people's side. You know, I, I got gigabit, but, you know, it goes up and down, you know, Comcast is. And people on the other end, you know, they may be in a coffee shop. They may be out of, on the road, and I want the, the sound quality to be the best it can. But also what I'm finding out is video emails are crushing it now. This has been a game changer for me and the people in the course. When you do a video and you start with something simple like a thank you video, well, you really can't screw it up. You can just say, hey, thanks for meeting me today. Uh, thanks for uh, replying to me because everyone loves a thank you, but they don't want it in text. It's cliche in text. But if you show that you put enough effort into it, much like a gift, it's coming up that time of year. Think about the gifts that have really mattered to you. Isn't it the ones like from your kids that drew a picture of you or, or something that just touched your heart? It wasn't the money. It was really the thought that somebody really heard you, that really wanted to connect with you, that cared about you. That's what would changed it. It wasn't the, the, the money. 
It was. It is the thought, and that seems cliche, but it is true. It, it is that connection that you have with another human being, that they honestly care enough about you to do it. That's what builds trust. And CoVideo has got a lot of um, templates to do this, to add it for the holiday season, uh, to convey the message that will be so much more effective than uh, you know, machine-generated Christmas card or an HTML card. So check that out at covideo.com. It is a game changer. And I've also did an episode with Dustin on the brutal truth about sales and selling, about how he has done it, how they're doing it. And they now have a Chrome plugin that makes it all super easy. Also, I had Katie, the president of Discover Org, on the brutal truth. And she was sharing the research about how men and women buy differently. Very critical for anybody in marketing and sales to understand these differences. Because even if your persona is 90% men or 90% women, that 10%, you're going to get somebody different. And how they buy is very different. So you want to check out that episode as well. If you want to talk about the courses and see if they're right for you, I've got a calendar link where we can grab 15 minutes, we jump on the phone, talk over what you're up against and what you'd like to accomplish. Uh, that's at b2brevenue.com training. Let's get into the interview with Alice. Hey, Alice, thanks for joining us today. As a way of getting started, tell us about yourself. Oh, well, first of all, I want to thank you um, for my being here today. I enjoy listening to your podcast, and I'm honored to be here. And a little bit about myself. I, um, <laughs> for the last 35 years, I've been a consultant trainer to organizations worldwide, helping salespeople sell more to make more money and improve management leadership so that there's, they also can make and earn more commission checks as well. And just a real quick circle back how I started. I taught and I was an educator in the public school systems. I was uh, selling for American greeting cards. I was a sales manager for them, VP of sales and marketing for Hard Hanks Communications. And basically, I've just gone full circle from teaching sixth graders and now I'm teaching <laughs> adults. <laughs> and people so, ask me. So you went backwards, I'll, huh? Yeah, I went backwards. Uh, <laughs> often there's not a lot of difference sometimes. The only difference is, is and I say this in jest, is that they don't um, shoot paper airplanes at me or spitballs, but not that my students did that either but uh <laughs> but the attention span of some of our of, of us as adults is no different than us as sixth graders <laughs> no that doesn't change down does it <laughs> <laughs> so that's been my mission is to touch as many sales people and sales managers lives so that they're earning you know their earning potentials their lifestyle is better and you know it's a win-win for them their company and their customers cool well, well Give us some insight into your approach. How do you go about doing this? Uh, the approach is, it's interesting. When I was teaching as in elementary school, uh, in order to keep my day job, I had to, the students tested in at the beginning of the year and they tested out at the end of the year and, and they had to test out higher. And I realized very much my very first time as a sales manager that it was very similar with um, my sales reps, that it's repetition, it's growth, it's, it's training, ongoing training. So I came up with the 3E sales accelerator technique. And the three components are that you engage, you energize, and you equip. And I try to do all of this in 30 minutes, I, I have been able to accomplish this, in 30 minutes or less because of attention spans and because of workloads and sales managers needing salespeople to be out in the field. And people learn by being engaged, being a part of it, and then nobody wants a talking head. So when they're actively involved and engaged in it, one, your brain works differently and your learning capacity is increased as well. So that's my little uh, part of my secret sauce of, of – um, of building a better sales team. And what do you see managers not doing that they should be doing when you go in? Well, there are three things. And, and now you get my secret sauce. There we go. I, it, the three things that sales managers don't do, and they may do one of the three or two of the three if they're good sales managers, 
And what I find is they're not doing all of the three. And and I have to say that sales managers who listen to me and do all three, their sales teams are meeting sales quotas consistently. And the three things are, one, I call it field rides, ride-alongs. And that can be, you know, if you're an outside sales team, they ride along in the field, watch, observe. If they're inside, they're telephone monitoring. Because what a salesperson actually does and what they tell you they did on the sales call and if they recall the conversation to you is totally different than what actually happened. So in order to be a really good coach, you need to see your sales team in action. And it's no different than any sports team, you know, whether they're baseball or soccer or even an orchestra. The conductor watches the, you know, the musician play and gives tips and techniques. And it's the same thing. So that's number one, field rides. The second is one-on-one coaching. And I start out recommending that this be done on a weekly basis. And then depending on the sales representative, whether it's every other week or every third week, but even your top performers want to be coached. And the one-on-one coaching isn't about what did you sell for me today or tell me all about your numbers. It's really also about what's going on. What's getting in your way this week? What barriers are you running into that's, that's, uh, that's preventing you from advancing sales or closing deals? And that's a total different conversation than tell me about what accounts you're working on and let me see if I can help you with them. Uh, because, go ahead. Yeah, because do you see many people doing that? More are doing it. It's amazing. I've been doing this for over 35 years. I've, I've been in business 35 years, but even when I was a sales manager, I was doing this. And you could, at the time, it was an anomaly. People weren't doing it. And when I recommended, and when am I going to have time to do this? How am I going to do that? And now it's, in, and you could find very few articles about it. Now, not only are there, you know, a plethora of articles about coaching, although they just say to coach, I find that interesting. Also, they're not giving specifics of what to do on the coaching call, but there are also more um, uh, software programs out to help with the coaching. Um, So I think it's picking up. But if you ask, I've done this when I do speaking engagements and I ask an audience of 100, 200 sales managers you know, what's your, what's the reason you're not coaching? And the number one excuse is they say they don't have time. And so my answer, you know, is if you really, if they made time for it, you know, it's how important is it to you to have be number one on the sales leaderboard? Yeah. <laughs> and if, it, if that's important to you, you're going to find time to do it. And then once they do it, what happens is, is the salespeople, the fight, they're not putting this as a sales manager, they're not putting out fires every minute. Your, your salespeople are much more empowered. Uh, they, they put out their fires themselves. There's not a long line out your door. Or if there is a long line out your door, the line is for not, is for, much greater sales and situations rather than the the mundane. And do you see the dashboard as kind of the, the new shiny object for the sales managers? It is. And some of the dashboards, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I look, I'm a techie too, and I like all the shiny objects. However, these three, uh, you know, Simple tips, the, these three actions as the sales managers do them, it's so personal, it's one-on-one. And that's what I'm also seeing. I'm going to just interject. One of the things I'm seeing is a change in the market is how so much sales is being done by text and email. And and although it, it works to some extent, I think people are hiding behind it. Yeah. And when I get salespeople to stop hiding behind the text and the email and go out and sell, their numbers go up, you know, their time to performance is so much greater. So I, I liken that to the same thing that you just asked, or is it the new shiny object? Um, we still have to do the work. We do. And then and talking about that, the third element, so the first one's field rides, observing actual 
actions. The second is the one-on-one coaching. And the third is, is skill building. And although you do some skill building in your one-on-one, but actual skill building training. And so you have a, that I call it the Monday morning sales meeting. It doesn't matter what day of the week somebody does it, but whether you do it every week or every other week or once a month, but sales managers responsibility is to build their salespeople to make them better today than they were when they walked in the door this morning. And the best way to do it is with, with through sales meetings. And this is what I'm saying. They can be done in 30 minutes or less. I try to work everything around this time crunch that people have so that there are no excuses and, it used to be in the olden days, when years ago, you know, you went to three day, five day, seven day. I even designed a 10 day onboarding um, new hire program for Knight Ritter newspapers at one time. They would have, you know, a cardiac arrest today if you talked about taking a salesperson out of the field for 10 days. Oh, so. yeah. It's unthinkable. <laughs> you know, so everything you have to think of, I've been able to take all of my big guns training and chunk everything down. At first, I chunked it down to hour. And then I had a lot of sales. I can't take my salespeople out of the field for an hour. So I said, all right, I'll take that challenge. How can I chunk everything down into 30 minutes or less and still have it be uh, high impact and high payoff you know, skill building sales meeting and, and it can be done. Um, so if, if sales managers would do those three things, they're going to find that they have more time because their salespeople are functioning at higher performance level. Now I, I see kind of all of this. I, I think the, the ride along, um, <clears throat> used to be a checkbox thing. There was never any structure to it. Um, mm. they would go and they'd usually get involved only at the very end of a real deal. It, it wasn't yeah. about, you know, building relationship with the rep, trying to understand what the rep's going up against. And, and usually the manager would hijack the meeting. <laughs> yes. So I, I, one of my favorite lines is it's their sales call, not yours. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so part of it is, you know, it's interesting. You, it, it, it's surprisingly interesting. However, it is important to train the sales managers exactly what to do on the sales when they do the sales ride alongs, because that's exactly what will happen. They'll hijack it. They'll take it over. Um, and it, it, do, it doesn't help. This, then you're not building the relationship with the sales rep and you're making the sales rep look bad to the customer. Um, I say to the sales managers, you know what, Your the whole goal is to have the sales rep, build the sales rep, learn what they're doing well, and learn their areas that you as a coach can improve on. And if you take over, you're not able to do that. And it's and one of the things I tell the sales managers is you're going to see the sales rep do 50 things wrong. You have got to bite your tongue and not say anything and observe. And if you can observe two or three conversations in a row and then out of all the things that you see that aren't that they could improve on, pick one. What's the one one skill? What's the one change, the one tweak they could make that would make the greatest difference in their future sales conversations? Because if you're a sales manager and you bombard the rep with, you did this wrong, that wrong, you should change this, you should change that. A, that's what you said. You're not going to build a relationship with the rep. They're not going to see their manager as a coach, a good coach. Uh, They're going to shut down They're not going to hear and they're not going to listen and they're not going to make the changes. But when you go in and you can pick one thing and make and discuss that with them, we can change one thing at a time. It's very hard to change 10 things at a time. Right. I agree with that completely. Now, I really like your coaching template. um, Yeah. Because it gives some structure to that conversation. So it doesn't turn into a deal review or um, a berating. Right. right. And there's a lot more to that. That before they get out of the car, the sales manager has to ask sales rep, okay, what's the plan for today? What, what am I looking for? What's your, the same thing the sales rep needs to prep. What's the objective of the call? What do you know? What do you need to know? 
What questions are you going to ask? How, what's your plan to find out what you need to know? And um, how will you know it's successful? And if the sales manager has that short dialogue with the sales rep in advance, and uh, then one, the sales rep's having a more effective, efficient sales conversation, but the, the sales manager knows exactly what's happening. Because it's interesting, when the sales rep will start asking a line of questions, sometimes the sales manager doesn't know where it's going if they haven't done this prep in advance. And so then the sales manager will jump in and ask a question and changes the whole trajectory of the conversation. And the sales rep is, uh, sometimes isn't able to recover from where they wanted it to go. Um, so what I ask the sales manager and the sales rep to make to talk beforehand and come to agreement that the sales manager really only gets to ask a question when they see it going off the rails completely. And as the other set of eyes and ears and mouth, they can ask one question to bring it back on track. And then they also have to be conscious of this. The, often if they ask the question, then the, the buyer or the client will then turn and respond to the sales manager and ask a question. And the sales manager has to be very careful and and remember to say, oh, well, Sally or John or whoever the sales rep is, they can, they can answer that for you. So that's a way that the sales manager doesn't continue, doesn't take over the conversation. And, you know, I, I went through my whole career with a, a call checklist before I went in mm -hmm. and it, it made all the difference. Um, and I'd see other reps and even my manager would say, well, let's see what they have to say. And I'd be like, uh, I didn't get up at four in the morning to climb onto an airplane. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, your, your time's valuable. Uh, yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, I, I go back. I, I know everybody's not a sports fanatic, but I do have to use the sports analogy that if, um, you know, you have to look at your sales team as your, this is the year, every year. You are going for the national championship. You, you know, you're going to be on television. You're going to get the big award, the big money, the big everything. Would you say to your salespeople, okay, you know, I'll see you next Sunday at the game. Or <laughs> let's see what, let's see what you got. All right, we're here. We're getting ready to walk in the customer. Let's see what you got. You know, they would never do that. And why, you know, so if sales managers would just think like a sports coach, watch the videos, play it back, have the discussion, practice, drill, repeat, so that it's natural, um, then they're, they will, they will, they, their sales reps will meet sales quotas consistently. Yeah. And, and this it, it still shocks me. And, uh, you know, I, I do some training and consulting and I, I really try and get people to come up with this list um, because what other profession? We're, we're performers. Um, people treat sales like riding a bicycle, but it's not like riding a bicycle. It's much more like you say, mm -hmm. playing a game. Pick any sport. Mm -hmm. Okay, have you ever seen somebody just get out of bed, put their uniform on and run on the field? Right, right. They're they, stretching, they, they're practicing, they're, you know, they, they have a huddle, they have the pregame, right. and they go and, through these rituals. Yes, they do. And even the best of the best. I mean, we can all use Michael Jackson, uh, uh, Johnson's, right? Jordan. Like, Jordan, <laughs> got my J's in there. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, here, he, he was the top of his game, the best, and he still went to practice every day. So it's back to the manager saying, oh, I hired professional salespeople, they're experienced, they've been with me 30 years. Well, you know, there's a difference between knowing and doing, and they may know what to do, but are they doing it? And they can even get better. Because you know what? The, the arena changes on a regular basis. The customer today isn't the same customer that – that we had 30 years ago or even five years ago. And just like everything changes in a nanosecond, your conversations with your customers, things change. And sales representatives have to continually drill so they're on top of their game to go with the change as well. 
I said, I don't know if you've read the book, uh, The uh, Checklist Manifesto. Oh, I have not. You got to check it out. out. Yeah, it was written by um, a Harvard uh, surgeon. And what Mm -hmm. he did to reduce surgical errors was to come up with a checklist. Mm-hmm. And, and he had enormous pushback because the surgeons were like, hey, I've been doing this for 30 years. I'm board certified. I've got 12 years of medical. And it's like, you're a human being. Uh, you've got, what, 50 elements and a person who's open. <laughs> the likelihood of forgetting <laughs> uh-huh. a sponge uh-huh. or, or a step wow. is, is very high. And, that's, and they, they reduced it by like 30%, all these surgical errors. That's phenomenal. Oh, I will get that. And it's the same. So we have a checklist for the sales rep. I'm, I'm you know, uh, and even if the checklist is to ask yourself these three questions before you get out of the car, um, but that's important. And then the checklist for the sales manager, and it's the same thing, the checklist for the coaching call. Um, you know, even if you're debriefed by yourself afterwards, did I let them talk 80% of the time? Did I let them come up with a solution or did I tell them? You know, all those are in the sales manager self debrief as well. Yeah. And, and one thing that I've seen consistently among the reps that I've interviewed is they grade themselves after each call mm-hmm. in some way, uh, whether it be A, B, and C or one through 10, instead of saying, oh, it was a great call or the call sucked. Right, that doesn't count. <laughs> right. So yeah, the the word is specifics. You know, you yeah. have what are the specifics? And it's the same when the manager walks out with the first debrief question we have for when they walk out of the call is, you know, what do you think would it went well on the call? You know, and then from what went well, you look at let's look at the checklist. What was your objective? Did you accomplish your objective? Uh, what were your I need to knows? Did you accomplish learning your need to knows? And we go through all the positives in the checklist, that part of the checklist, and then get to the, what would you do differently? What do you think you could have done differently? You know, how could you improve it if you had a do over right now? And um, that people, it's much easier to change. It's much easier. You can switch gears on the very next sales conversation by doing it that way. And whatever they didn't do well or thought that they could improve, you'll see them putting in the very next conversation. And I like your idea of doing like, not an offsite, but like a meal, like a breakfast or a lunch where -hmm. where it has more of a social casual um, rapport building element to it versus a job review, you know, the annual 360 type thing. Coaching is not an annual job review. (laughs) And that's the mistake. It's a to- it's a totally different conference. You don't wait till the annual review to start telling people what you thought they should have been doing all year long. Yes. <laughs> and so, you know, it's a surprise. I, I don't know why it's a surprise to managers when their salespeople aren't uh, making numbers. I'm going to, you know, Patricia, uh, we were, I was out in Orange County, California with an organization and she had just come in as a sales manager and there were um, five sales teams and her sales team was fifth on the leaderboard. They had gone through something like three or four managers within two years and she's been brought in and she, I've been working with her from other companies before and she remembered the secret sauce and she said, that's what I'm doing. She started field writing, one-on-one coaching and having little mini weekly sales meetings in eight weeks. This is a team who had been number five in eight weeks, moved up to the number one slot. That's, that's how simple it is. And, and sales is a very habit forming mm-hmm. business. I mean, mm-hmm. and bad habits form very easily as well. And, and you get the finger pointing and the, the misrepresentation mm-hmm. and the us against them. And it's my territory. It's the product. It's everything but me. So, 
That's a list of excuses. So you have a choice. Yeah. No. <laughs> you have a choice. You live and live with the excuses and you're not going to earn what you want to earn. And you're going to start worrying about me, the, your boss breathing down your neck. And you're going to worry if you have a day job or you can say, what, it's, it, what can I do differently to turn this around if it's up to me? And, and how, what's the best way to do the skills part? I'm sure you have more experience at that than I do. This the skills part. Well, you know, good. There are managers out there if uh, already spending I, the weekends or Saturday or Sunday on the internet scouring for good creative, you know, skill building ideas. And so the thing is, is what's my idea for it? I have the answer for the sales managers. If you don't mind my sharing that now, I, you know, I was being a school teacher. It was very easy for me to design skill building meetings. And I use the three E sales acceler technique. They're always engaging. They start right off with an engagement, you know, no talking head from the sales manager. Let's say it's, I'm going to give you a simple, even if it's objections, it's so easy. Okay. What objections are you hearing now? You know, because objections from the, from your audience, um, changes from time to time. And so what are the big ones right now that you're coming up or you're hearing the most often? And then you introduce the skill. So that's kind of the equip. You give them the technique. And maybe you've already given the technique, but it's a refresher. Our technique for, for objections is you do not have to have an answer. It's amazing. I watch so many sales managers run an objections meeting and they say, okay, let's come up with our pad answer to it costs too much. And let's come up to our pad answer that I already have, you know, satisfied my, my supplier. Well, pat answers work really less than 50% of the time. And the key is, is not to have an answer. The key is to have a question. And so how do you ask a question when you hear the, you know, I'm not satisfied with my supply or the timing is not right. Uh, it's, it costs too much, you know, whatever they say, have a question, engage the customer. So that's, so we've introduced, you know, get them making a list. So they're active, they're engaged, they're talking to each other. Then we introduce the skill and then they practice it. And for objections, we have them stand up and we throw a tennis ball around. And if you, when you catch the tennis ball, it's your turn. I, the manager throws out the objection and the sales rep has to answer it with a question. And so, again, you're thinking on your feet, just like you have to do with your customers. And, um, you know, and in 30 minutes or 50, you can even do that exercise in 15 minutes. You've got everybody kind of retooled. You know, breaking that bad habit that you talked about or taking, dropping the shortcut that they were doing. And they're now, you know, re-equipped. Uh, and so you've engaged, equipped and energized them because so now they are feeling a lot better. Their confidence is up and they're energized to go out there and have that next conversation. So what I did was I, you know, have been doing this for years and uh, I've had to turn sales teams around when I was a sales manager. I inherited sales teams that needed to be turned around. So I use my Monday morning sales meetings. So I have, um, you know, a plethora of Monday morning sales meetings, plus our big gun sales training. And so what I've done over the time now is I've chunked everything down. It's either a five minute sales huddle energizer or the uh, most it is is a 30 minute uh, you know, bite-sized skill builder. And I got them available for sales managers. You talk about them. I talk about them not having time. So I said, all right, I'm going to save you time. You don't have to take any time during the week. I've done it for you. And basically, if you can read, talk, and tell time, that's how I wrote them. I wrote them so you can read, talk, and tell time all at the same time. That's the trick you can lead the most effective, efficient, you know, energizing and equipping sales meeting. Excellent. Um, hey, Alice, I really appreciate your time today. Where do people go to learn about your work, connect with you? Uh, well, it, um, I've set something up for your audience, if you'd like. I was offering a one month free for your audience. Is that something you would like? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. So um, it's <laughs> real simply, it's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash one month free, all one word. 
And uh, sales managers can go there and learn more and have a month's free of four weeks of, um, of skill boosters for their team. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this episode. And I really would appreciate everybody who goes on to LinkedIn, connects up with me or follows me there. If you happen to see some of my content flying by, if you could throw a little thumbs up or a comment or a share, I definitely appreciate it. It helps spread the word about the podcast. And make sure you're checking out my website, b2brevenue.com. You can get my free book on how companies make product selections. It's a real book. Uh, it was on, it is on Amazon, but I give it away for free. Just register there. It'll email you a link to it and you can just download the PDF from there. Also, if you want to check out the courses, start the conversation, get the meeting or closing the complex sale and you have more questions about it. The short answer is there are video courses. You get access for a year, but it's also a community. What does that mean? You can ask questions anytime via voicemail or email. I answer them within a week, put them into the course. We have office hours every other week. It's an hour long where you course where you can basically i pick a topic answer questions you can ask questions also you can schedule one-on-ones for free and we just talk through your particular use case and that gets shared with the course so if you don't have time for office hours or the timing doesn't work or you just want some more one-on-one help that's all included for a whole year so it's really a a year to go from where you are to where you want to be and so it's not just videos it's not just knowledge it's practice it's getting feedback you can send me emails you can send me uh your presentation i'll help you with anything that you need to close the complex sale or get the meeting and you can check out them at b2brevenue.com So that's it. I really appreciate it. And please tell somebody about the podcast and let me know if I can help you in any way. Oh, and you want to hear some results from the course? Well, here you go. You you know, I love the approach. It's working for me just fantastic. If I sent you some of the emails, which I should, the conversations that I'm having with people, I, I think you'd be blown away because they're not really about work. Yeah. I've figured out if you can kind of get personal with them, like one lady, it's all about her family, kids. And then I sprinkled in a little bit around work and she's LinkedIn and sending me messages on LinkedIn, <laughs> photos of her family. <laughs> um, no, I'm not even kidding. I should show this to you. You'd be stunned. I was shocked. And we're going, she, she even, we're going to lunch on September 6th. And yesterday <laughs> she shot me a LinkedIn message and said, Hey, Ron, why don't we get on the phone and do a video call beforehand so our lunch isn't so awkward? We're like barely not meeting each other for the first time. <laughs> oh, holy cow, right? Like, this is unbelievable. So this is not the first time that this has happened. She's kind of an extreme, yeah. but um, I'm starting to figure out a pattern where I can actually make this a process, you know? So good, good. Yeah. I'll show you that. So, it's getting to that point. And I'm kind of, every time I do this, I'm like, God, this is unbelievable. You know? So, and it feels better too, doesn't it? Oh, Brian, let me tell you something to be able to go, go to lunch with her. I'll even talk to her on the phone, right? We're going to talk about, uh, family, kids, work life harmony. Cause we read, a, I shared a thing with her from Bezos about work life harmony. This is where the conversation will start. Now at some point we're both not stupid, right? We know we're going to talk about work. <laughs> we know why we're both there. Right. But to kick it off this way is so much better. And to end that lunch with the last five to eight minutes of telling, you know, well, what are you guys doing with digital?